Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, whenever it might be in wherever you are in the world. My name is Jared Schaefer. I'm a student in Professor Seggi's Psych 14 class at Los Angeles City College, which is Abnormal or Clinical Psychology. And this is my presentation on Bipolar 1 Disorder. Bipolar 1 Disorder is a mood disorder, and it is classified in the DSM-5 between the schizophrenic spectrum and other psychotic disorders and depressive disorders. It creates a diagnostic bridge of symptoms that deserve their own class before it was grouped with depressive symptoms. But because of the mania or hypomania involved, and specifically for bipolar one, you do need an episode of mania. In fact, that is the only essential diagnostic criteria to bipolar one disorder to being diagnosed as that. However, depressive episodes and hypomania, episodes of hypomania often accompany it. Now, many of you have probably heard manic depression, the 19th century term. And speaking of the 19th century, this, this painting that we're looking at is a Vincent van Gogh painting, who is, you can find it written about extensively that he most likely was manic depressive or now bipolar one with the high level mania that is above the hypomania, which is the limits of mania in bipolar two. And we're gonna get onto all this more, but I wanna bring up another old 19th century term right now called effective psychosis. That possibly also could have been um, applied to Mr. Van Gogh. Now that obviously requires psychosis and manic depression requires both mania and depression. Now, Bipolar 1 does not require in the diagnosis depression or psychosis. A pure episode of mania is all that's required. Um, there can be psychosis, which makes it bipolar 1 automatically, and of course there's commonly depression, but it can be a disorder with just pure mania symptoms. Even one lifetime episode of mania is enough to qualify to diagnose someone as bipolar one, but one episode of mania is not necessarily enough. There are other things that can induce mania and we'll get into that as well. So what are the diagnostic criteria for bipolar one? There's really just one. It is necessary to meet the criteria for a manic episode. As I mentioned, this is the only essential requirement for diagnosis. Uh, now mania also, as I mentioned, is commonly preceded by hypomania, hypomanic or major depressive episodes, but it's not required. Now there can be any combination of this. You can be manic and crash into a depressive episode. You can be hypomanic and go into a manic episode and then back down into hypomania. You can have a manic period and then a euthymic period with no symptoms and then have a depressive period. So pretty much any combination of these probably have occurred and are certainly possible. And as long as there is, you meet, as long as you meet the criteria for a manic episode uh, that is not induced from medical conditions or uh, substances, substance abuse or use or medicine, um, you can be diagnosed as uh, bipolar one and uh, begin treatment. So what are the criteria for a manic episode? Now this is this is uh, something that's popularized in the media as is uh, going manic and being manic, and we're going to look at a cartoon later. But what it, it's it's excessive happiness. If you can if you can make a concise definition, it is it is extreme self confidence. It is a very high level of energy, and the notion here is the the thing to remember here is that it's episodic. That's something that we're going to keep coming back to is that bipolar one and two are a disorder that is episodic. They come and they go. There's a distinct difference, a distinct separation, a heightened difference in someone's personality or mood and behavior that does not exist in the normal. Personality disorders, anxiety disorders, these things are not episodic. These things are rather more consistent. So one week is the, the time limit that the DSM-5 gives for a manic episode of heightened mood and possibly irritable. This is sort of a subset. You don't really read too much about mixed episodes of irritable and uh, heightened mood, happy and irritable at the same time. It can occur, but mostly irritable is a separate subset, which is why we'll see in the bottom there in, in B, the, the seven symptoms that are gonna be on the next slide for a manic episode 
if the mood is only irritable, you need four of them to really round out the uh, di diagnosis of this is a manic episode indeed and to not misdiagnose. However, if it's just increased energy and happiness and you are impervious to criticism um, and involved in all kinds of creative projects and have endless energy, more or less, kind of from, from uh, I hate to use the phrase otherworldly, but kind of unexplicable endless energy. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, not something that um, is common to your demeanor in a non-manic state. That, then you only need three or more of the following symptoms. Three, and then of course you can have um, more. Um, however, it says uh, at the bottom of A there, if hospitalization is necessary, that makes it automatically a uh, manic episode. So two days of heightened mood and you've been harmed yourself, harmed to others, or really um, uh, prompting concern from your friends and loved ones and you you know, are, are end up at a hospital, it's, it's gonna be manic regardless of uh, Length, um, but you know, I would, I would, I would caution quick diagnosis in this because there are a lot of like pitfalls and missteps, and we'll get to the differential diagnosis uh, later. So these seven. Um, oh, and I want to go back for a second. Uh, okay, apparently I can't go back. That the the previous slide was uh, Rothko, Mark Rothko. All the uh, painters that you will see, all the paintings that you're going to see in this presentation are from people uh, who have been written about uh, to have uh, bipolar one or bipolar symptoms. Um, so this is obviously Van Gogh with um, his ear bandage. Um, you know, self-harm is something you read about again and again with, with a high level manic episode. These, you know, you, you read these, a couple of these, inflated self-esteem or grandiosity, impervious to social criticism. You know, there's nothing you can't do. You wanna write a novel, you wanna fix the car, restore the car even, you know, and, and, and foolish purchases, you know, it's you, you buy a car to restore, anything you can imagine, spending sprees is very common to read about. They kind of seem, you know, in a way, uh, cool. I've heard it described as that actually. So I'm, I'm going to quote someone who, who referred to bipolar one as cool. Um, you know, the more we get into it, and if you look down at seven, excessive involvement in activities that have a high potential for painful consequences, we're going to come across a term later called that's, that's catastrophic consequences. So, you know, keep that in mind in terms of when we when you decrease need for sleep and oh, it wouldn't it be great to just work on creative projects 24 hours a day and not be tired. Well, there are there is an intense backlash to feeling, you know, uh, more. Uh, excitement and energy than you should be. You can and do crash often in catastrophic ways. I want to mention about two, decreased need for sleep. This differs. It's distinct from insomnia in that a person who suffers from insomnia wants sleep, craves sleep, is upset that they're not sleeping, is going to see uh, medical professionals trying to figure out a way to sleep. A person in a manic episode doesn't care. They, they couldn't be bothered by the fact that they only slept two hours last night. Uh, you know, if they mention it all, it's like as a brag, I would imagine. Um, more talkative than usual, three. And 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 we'll, we'll see later that uh, people in the throes of mania uh, don't want to go anywhere near a hospital, it, that, which is very common. They, they, they do not think they're ill uh, and do not wish to be treated and will fight vehemently is the language that the DSM-5 uses in order to avoid treatment or hospitalization. And that makes sense, you know, if you had an increased amount of energy, an increased amount of self-esteem, we're gonna see later that, that uh, um, improved hearing, vision, and sight are possible symptoms. You would not feel as though you were sick. You would feel that you were better, superhuman. You would think that you had been enlightened or, or a Kundalini awakening or something and would certainly not want to be locked up, which is, um, you know, I, I, I've read a fear of people undergoing mania that they that they know that this is something that they're not allowed to be feeling, uh, if, I'm, if I'm remembering the quote accurately. Okay, so flights are ideas of subjective experience, thoughts that are racing, constant creativity, constant uh, work distractibility. Again, you only need three of these with a euphoric, a highly euphoric mood, four with um, an irritable mood. Uh, and of course, you can have more. Uh, distractibility you, you, the, in the flights of ideas kind of could potentially go hand in hand where someone talks their way around everything that sees or happens as, you know, oh, look, a car. 
Oh, look, a squirrel. Oh, that's a cool outfit, you know. Increase goal-directed activity. I pause there and say goal-directed is really crucial. People involved in projects that they have no business, no training, no previous expertise, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make an invention, and I'm also, at the same time as I'm working an in invention, seeking publicity. I read about this, you know, for the invention, kind of like, you know, working with, uh, you know, four or five hands on different things. Uh, and separate from that is psychomotor agitation. And that is activity, but it's not goal directed. So that it can be either or or a possible mixture of both. And then and then we get to seven, the involvement in activities that have a high potential for painful consequences. Um, we are going to see, you know, uh, we're going to talk about suicide. We're going to talk about uh, sexual behavior that could possibly, um, you know, uh, uh, sexual escapades, episodes, um, you know, lots of, uh, um, you know, sexual encounters that uh, could end relationships. Uh, you know, there's this flight of ideas and uh, racing thoughts sometimes gets communicated in emails or text. Every once in a while, we will read about a person in the entertainment community that sent like a 13 page email to everyone on their team that works for them. And someone on that team outs it to the media. And you know, that, I'm not saying that that is a manic episode, but it, it could be, it's, it's just a, a, a red flag that, that, that could be the, the flight of ideas and racing thoughts and this, this, this energized um, activity and work that could be this 13-page um, email or really, um, you know, manic text or something. And and these have a tendency to out someone as crazy, whether it's it's contained to just your work or whether it actually gets out to, uh, you know, the 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 TMZs and the Gawkers and the the, the um, you know, that kind of world. So let's let's move on here to the last two of the, the big ones. Those are the seven symptoms that you need, but you also need a marked impairment in social or occupational functioning, okay? This is a big difference between what's hypomanic, hypo meaning below, and manic, meaning a more amount of energy. In hypomanic, bipolar two, um, you don't have a social or occupational function. You just have this high energy and um, it doesn't necessitate hospitalization and you don't harm yourself or others and you're not psychotic. If any one of these things occur, it gets raised to the level of mania. Now, I had a um, psychiatrist friend who told me that, uh, you know, CEOs and captains of industry, they're said to operate at this like... Uh, a uh, hypomanic level and that's where we all kind of want to be to be like working 18 hours a day and like a decreased need for sleep and really getting things done uh, you know i suppose i i certainly wouldn't want that you know like i said earlier any amount of uh heightened mania is going to crash it's not something that can be maintained uh specifically if it's induced by a bipolar disorder whether it be one or two um, we'll get to this later with the D, and we'll return to it. Um, the episode is not attributable to um, the physiological effects of a substance, substance-induced bipolar disorder, substance-induced mania, or another medical condition. Um, medical conditions would be uh, tumors in different areas of the brain, the limbic system, frontal lobe, temporal lobe. There's something called frontotemporal neurocognitive disorder, which involves the shrinkage of both the frontal and the temporal lobes that can create a manic episode. Uh, cocaine, methamphetamine, pharmaceutical speeds such as dexedrine or Ritalin, steroids, antidepressants. This surprised me. Certain antidepressants, uh, people will, when they are first prescribed to them, people will get high and um, for, in a layman's terms. And that can induce what seems like a manic episode. L-DOPA, um, uh, which is a, uh, a, a Parkinson's medicine. Um, but the, 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 the crucial thing here for the distinction between mania and hypomania is duration and severity. So let's, let's look at that. The, the hypomanic episode, the criteria for that, identical to a manic episode. All seven of the symptoms that we went through are the same. The only two differences are duration and severity. The duration is a little bit shorter, four days as opposed to a week is all that you need. And the other main difference is, as I said, no marked impairment in social or occupational functioning, no hospitalization, and no psychotic features. Now, again, any combination of these, you can have an impairment in occupational functioning and psychotic features. You can have uh, hospitalization 
uh, without impairment, but with uh, self-harm that occurs, uh, you know, uh, secretly perhaps, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's really quite endless. Um, I do want to mention about the psychotic features. There are mood, what's the, the two type of specifications that the DSM-4 gives for psychotic features are mood congruent psychotic features and mood incongruent psychotic features. Now, mood congruent is when someone's behavior matches their state of mind. You know, when someone is, say, in a mixed episode, and we'll return to this as well, a mixed episode of mania would be an episode where someone is extremely happy one moment, and then in a depressive episode moments later, they could last moments, could last hours, and rarely it could last days. But let's say they're in that depressive moment, and there's some sort of um, psychosis of doom, perhaps, or something where they are horribly sad and horribly not willing to go on and, and you know, attempting suicide with alcohol or pills or, uh, you know, self-harm or something like that, that would be mood congruent. The state matches the action. Mood incongruent would be the opposite of that, wherein if someone was manically happy and euphoric and talking about how much they loved life and at the same time cutting their wrist, that would be mood incongruent. Now, here we have... And, and you, hypomania can occur in bipolar 1. Um, it must occur in bipolar 2 along with this, a major depressive order. But in bipolar 1, the major depressive episode, excuse me, episode um, does not need to occur. Neither does a hypomanic episode, but they, of course, can and commonly do. The rare bipolar 1 um, individual is purely manic. And most of the purely manic individuals will be men. I'm not really going to get into the, the, uh, the depressive criteria. They are the same for major depressive disorder. And, um, you know, take a look at them. And we all should know them. And I think they've, they've been gone over in, in different places quite a bit. So, uh, but again, it's the same exact uh, criteria as for major depressive disorder. You need five or more of the following nine symptoms for a two-week period and at least one of the symptoms must be one of the first two listed. Depressed mood most of the time and loss of interest or pleasure or anhedonia most of the day. Now, so if this, this adds, this is a support uh, perhaps for a bipolar one, but not a requirement. And this is, of course, this is a Rothko, um, just a, one of my favorite painters. Um, he, and, and we'll talk about suicide later and unfortunately, Mr. Rothko and Mr. Van Gogh um, both uh, committed suicide. And uh, again, if you think uh, you would like to experience mania, you know, perhaps you haven't thought about it enough. Uh, associated features uh, supporting diagnosis. Um, as I mentioned before, people in the throes of a manic episode don't want to go to the hospital. They do not think they're ill. And that, of course, makes sense. They are feeling wonderful. They are feeling better than they ever felt. And they have things to do. That's the nature of it, where they are... Um, buzzing around, incredibly busy, and, um, you know, uh, impervious to criticism. Hey, I'm a little worried about you. Why are you worried about me? Look at, the, you know, look at all the, you know, I, I wrote you 19 love poems, honey. And, and it's just they have a comeback for everything is uh, uh, what I've read. Vehemently resist efforts to be treated. Vehemently. That is um, language from the DSM-4. Five, excuse me. Uh, this is fascinating. Change, dress, makeup, personal appearance, more sexual flamboyant style. There's, there's, there's this, uh, again, the change, the change in the typical to the uh, manic individual. As I mentioned before, sharper sense of hearing, smell, or vision. Um, truly fascinating symptom there. I would love to know more about the biology of that. But now it gets a little darker. Antisocial behaviors. And of course, antisocial does not mean I want to lock myself in a room and play Doom. Antisocial is the opposite of pro-social, and it means aggression, it means violence, it means hostility to strangers, to loved ones. It means the opposite of pro-social behavior. Gambling gets mentioned a lot. Um, two catastrophic ends, you know, uh, this, the, 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 the energy that would be uh, put into these creative endeavors I'm talking about would also be put into sexual pursuits, gambling pursuits, rec reckless driving is mentioned. And um, that's where you get uh, the catastrophic excuse me, consequences 
and uh, suicidality. Um, there are, uh, you know, also the possibility of overdoses. Um, it is very common that people in an episode use substances and they do tend to use more of the substances than they, uh, substance use disorder is comorbid with bipolar one. We're gonna look at that later. And the nature of the brain of someone in a manic episode, they call it a hot brain, where it is lit up. And you can look at, uh, you know, a scan brain pet, PET scans of manic brains, and it just, you know, it's a Christmas tree, and they are just functioning on all cylinders. So how much higher, or you know, how how you can't get the level variation that you're used to with uh, the drugs that you're used to using. So you do tend to overuse, and ODs overdoses are um, very common in um, uh, manic states, catastrophic consequences. And here we are talking about suicide. This is, um, this is another Rothko. This is the darkest Rothko I could find. And um, you know, it's, it's certainly fitting. I want you to remember these numbers. The lifetime risk is estimated to be 15 times that of the general population. Okay, remember these until we get to the next slide when we talk about prevalence, okay? This one is, is flooring to me. Bipolar disorder may account for one quarter of all completed suicides. Now that's from the DSM-5. It doesn't state whether it's bipolar one or bipolar one and bipolar two. However, this is as good a time as any to talk about that, that I like to think of the distinctions between bipolar two and bipolar one as being in a river. And you, you know, you, you may remember how you, or have seen where they mark um, spaces in a river. And well, the water flows through those markings, through those divisions. And certainly it's possible to be diagnosed as bipolar two, have a full manic episode where previously you had, you'd just been hypomanic, hypomanic and then, you know, uh, now be diagnosed with bipolar one. So it's not a clear cut distinction where one is never the other. And it's, 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 they're very connected. And again, I do wanna say that a lot of people tend to think that bipolar one is worse or more severe than bipolar two because of the hypomania being a, a lower example of mania, a less intense example of mania than mania. However, there are so many different variations of this disorder, of these two disorders, I should say, where if in, you were a female who, um, it's more common for females to experience uh, rapid cycling, which is four or more mood episodes a year, and you with being depressive, hypomanic, or manic, and you experience five, six, seven, uh, mood episodes a year, is it really better off, worse, different than the male who, again, typically it's the male who, who, who solely experiences the mania. Are, which is better? Would you rather have one lifetime episode of mania or would you rather have seven mood episodes a year? And now what if I told you if the one lifetime episode of mania resulted in catastrophic consequences? So it's, it's, it, it's, I, it's foolish to uh, get into uh, one is better, one is worse, you know? Um, uh, past attempts and recent depressions over the past year are associated with greater risk of suicide. So one quarter of all suicides may account be accounted for by um, bipolar uh, sufferers. And let's look at this. The 12 month prevalence estimate in the continental US is 0.6%. So, and, and again, across 11 countries, it ranged from 0.0, .0 to 0.6 again. So 0.6 of the population, more or less, accounts for one quarter of the suicides. That's, that's truly, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, and this is, this is uh, in the background is uh, Vincent van Gogh's, not Starry Night, but Starry Night on the Rhone, a lesser known painting, um, but uh, one of my favorites. Um, the lifetime male to female prevalence ratio is 1.1 to one. So males have it slightly more than females. That is for one, um, one is slightly more common to occur in a male than a female. I believe females uh, have a more uh, a higher prevalence to have bipolar two. However, there are lots of gender related diagnostic issues. Woman in White by Vincent van Gogh, um, we're looking at it for females for bipolar one. Females are more likely to experience rapid cycling and mixed states. Again, rapid cycling, is four episodes or more each year mood episodes. That's man, uh, manic, hypomanic, or depressive. And mixed states, as I mentioned before, 
is when um, the the episode contains mania as well as a depressive state and it can be moments hours and rarely but it's possible days um, as I mentioned before females are more likely to experience depressive symptoms than males males are more likely to be um, solely manic um, there's a different pattern of comorbidity that has higher rates of lifetime eating disorders now that seems uh, pretty understandable as eating disorders are uh, 90 to 95 percent uh, women that suffer from them. However, more surprising is the alcohol use disorder because the ratio male to male to female in alcohol use disorder is two to one. So it's perhaps unusual that females have a higher pattern of comorbidity with alcohol use disorder and bipolar one. Now this next bullet point might bring a little insight to that. Bipolar one females have a much greater likelihood of alcohol use disorder than do females in the general population. So there's something happening, whether it be genetically or life stress, that, that makes the bipolar one female uh, more inclined to alcohol use disorder. Um, I, I don't know, perhaps there could also be an element of wanting to calm the mania with the use of alcohol. I'm sure that has occurred in, in many manic states for many people who um, live and lived with uh, bipolar one. Uh, prognostic factors and uh, risk, the a tenfold increase of, it, there's clearly a genetic component here uh, that increases with the degree of uh, kinship. Now the family history element here is for a family member that is either bipolar one or bipolar two that results in the tenfold increase of um, the individual in question having uh, bipolar one disorder. So uh, again, the, the fluid nature and the interrelated nature of bipolar one and bipolar two are there. Now specific to bipolar one, the concordance rate for identical twins is 55%. If, if your identical twin has um, bipolar one disorder, you are 55% of the time likely to be diagnosed and you know suffer and live with uh, bipolar one disorder as well. And then it drops to 5% in dizygotic twins. Uh, uh, fraternal twins. So just a clear genetic component. However, there's a 45% where uh, a percentage of the time where it doesn't occur, where you don't uh, develop and get diagnosed with uh, bipolar one and don't suffer uh, manic episodes. So multiple things are at play, uh, like, like the, the, the diathesis, um, uh, you know, uh, model for um, abnormality wherein uh to me it's uh it's it's, it's this is a, this metaphor is a bit around the world but kind of worth the trip and in, in tim burton's batman the original tim burton batman that the, the first one that he directed uh the joker played by jack nicholson poisons gotham and he uh poisons all the um uh bathroom products all the cosmetics um you know and and they don't know what's poisoned and what's not and they but it's not one thing. It's not just if you use the shampoo, will you uh, be poisoned and die? You need a combination. You need to use the deodorant, the toothpaste, and the mouthwash, and then you um, uh, are poisoned and die. And I, you know, a macabre, uh, and uh, as a metaphor as that is, it is probably most likely an element of stress in life, genetic factors, possibly uh, substance use that, that brings about this mania. You know, and it becomes a very uh, chicken and egg discussion. Uh, and we will get into that a little bit more later. Uh, it is more common in high income than low income countries, uh, twice as much, 1.4% to 0.7%. And this is uh, interesting, uh, higher rates among separated, divorced, or widowed individuals as opposed to individuals who are married or single. Now, of course, we, the, the causality here is unclear. We don't know if people are divorced because they're bipolar or bipolar because they're divorced. Um, and it, it probably is mixed or maybe not, but um, you know, it's, it's something to uh, be noted. Treatment. Lithium is the most common treatment for uh, bipolar one disorder. It is effective in seven of 10 uh, bipolar patients. It's a naturally occurring, ele occurring element. It's a salt. 
uh, number three on the periodic table. Toxic in high doses or even in low doses over a period of time. If you take a little bit too much every day, you can develop what's called chronic toxicity and you can die. You can die from lithium poisoning. So, you know, it's important that um, bipolar individuals have uh, lithium levels taken um, in their blood and to see that they're not in a dangerous level. Uh, the discovery that lithium could be a uh, medicine for uh, bipolar 1 disorder and bipolar 2 as well uh, was discovered by an Australian psychiatrist named John Cade. This is post-World War II and he was doing experiments with uh, bipolar individuals and he was doing experiments on their urine, with their urine, and he found that their urine was more toxic than other individuals' urine. And he was injecting uric acid into the into guinea pigs, actual guinea pigs, not human beings who were guinea pigs, but actual animal guinea pigs. And he added lithium for solubility, to increase solubility of the uric acid. And that is what worked, not the uric acid. So that's that's there's so many um, unusual and often bizarre uh, eureka moments in science and in medicine, and this is definitely one of them. And I, I want to talk about the the success. Jamie Lowell wrote about three uh, three or three or so years ago, two and a half more or less. She wrote an article in uh, the New York Times Magazine, and she suffers from bipolar two, I believe. And the article was called, I don't believe in God, but I believe in lithium. So, you know, there you go. This is effective medicine. And if you read the percentages on some of the other medicines for, for treating um, disorders, you, you tend not to get a patient saying, I don't believe in God, but I believe in lithium. So that is someone who's very happy with their medicine. And we have... Uh, uric acid and uh, guinea pigs and John Cade to thank for it. Um, other mood stabilizers uh, are anti-seizure drugs such as Tegretol or Depakote. Now it says at the bottom here, therapy rarely helpful. That's from the DSM-5. But if you if you bounce around online, you will find people talking about the, the dual diagnosis nature with substance use disorder, suicidality, and the comorbidity of other disorders, uh, anxiety disorders, we'll get to that in a moment. You know, why not try the therapy? Perhaps you're one of the rare individuals that it helps. You know, you could be saying, I don't believe in God, but I believe in therapy. So let's, I don't want anyone to look at that um, slot, look at that bullet point and think, oh, well, therapy's not going to work for me, so I'm not even going to try. And before we move on, I do want to mention another book, Catherine Jameson, who wrote An Unquiet Mind, another bipolar um, in person living with bipolar, who um, wrote the book on bipolar and is a, a you know, psychiatrist as well. Um, so differential diagnosis, major depressive order. Now, mania and hypomania can occur in major depressive order as well, making it difficult, adding to the diagnostic complexity. Um, but there are fewer symptoms and a shorter duration when it occurs with major depressive disorder. And it's the depression that is the predominant state and not the episodic, one-week, um, full-on mania that we're looking for. So it, it's it's subtle, and it, it takes a careful eye. And always look at the history of hypomania, hypomania and mania. Um, irritability can also occur in major depressive disorder. So that's something that, that can um, add to um, the, the potential to misdiagnose uh, bipolar 1 or major depressive disorder. Um, other bipolar disorders, too, obviously, is the, the distinction between uh, a manic and hypomanic episode could be very, very fine. So you want to get a full check the history of mania and see if there had been larger manic episodes in the past. Again, all you need is one manic episode to be classified as bipolar one. But also, again, one is not always enough. If it is substance-induced or medicine-induced or medical condition-induced, again, clinical judgment is needed. Substance-induced, medication-induced bipolar disorder, what, what we're talking about. It's essentially, mania caused by substances or medicine. Again, it's cocaine, methamphetamine, prescription speed, excuse me, Steroids, antidepressants, L-DOPA, you know, I've read about marijuana. You will not see this in the DSM-5, but 
all over the internet you will find marijuana induced psychosis marijuana induced mania marijuana induced bipolar so you know and and in our textbook the strength of marijuana the increasing uh potency there is is mentioned so that may be something to look for in a dsm-6 that that marijuana will be listed on the uh, drugs that induce uh bipolar now therapies light therapy and electroconvulsive therapy ECT can also induce a manic state now the the to be a real manic state the the mania must outlast the physiological effects of the substance or the medication meaning that if you um, go manic after a binge use of cocaine or go manic after a electro convulsive therapy you know at some point you're going to come down you know in day two perhaps day three, you would think that you would want to come down. If you're on day five or six and you're still, you know, working on your, um, you know, new comic book idea feverishly, perhaps look into bipolar one manic disorder, manic episode, excuse me, uh, anxiety disorders such as general anxiety disorder, panic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, the trauma, um, trauma disorder, that these could be the primary one primary diagnosis um, that needs to be moved away from bipolar one in the differential diagnosis, but it could also be comorbid. You could have the uh, existence of both someone with social anxiety disorder and um, bipolar one. Uh, attention deficit disorder. Um, this is especially common in children. Uh, and it, or adolescents, and the symptoms very much overlap. Rapid speech, racing thoughts, distractibility, uh, less need for sleep. Um, again, we're looking for a distinct episode. In all of these, the, what's going what's gonna to really qualify bipolar one is that distinct episode of mania. That is uh, a, a week or more, or two weeks even. You know, they 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 do tend to crash because if you are having the social impairment, if you are necessitating, necessitating, necessitating um, hospitalization, uh, you know, they, they, will, they will come to a rather rapid and abrupt end. But uh, things like uh, PTSD and your anxiety disorders, they're going to be more throughout someone's experience and their personality and their life as opposed to an eight day heightening. Uh, personality disorders. Uh, borderline is the chief one here. Again, borderline is very, there's imp impulsivity and, and uh, you know, uh, dangerous and uh, chaotic behavior, uh, mood lability, which is um, mood shifting rapidly from depression to uh, irritability to uh, euphoria and mania. But again, it's a matter of whether or not this is episodic. And the DSM-5 cautions not to diagnose a personality disorder during an untreated mood episode, mood episode. So you need mood stabilizers, lithium, possibly antipsychotics. And then when the person is back to a um, more uh, normal state for them, you can see if there is in fact a borderline or personality issue uh, disorder going on. Uh, disorders with prominent irritability. irritability. Uh, these are also common in children and adolescents, but again, it need to be episodic. You need a clear episode or more than one. Now, if someone is severely irritable throughout their life, you know, uh, prominently and, uh, you know, pervasively severely, ir severely irritable, uh, a possible diagnosis is disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Mania, however, represents a change from that clear, uh, from a clear change from the typical behavior. And a irritability disorder would, you know, it, it wouldn't be as unexpected. It'd be while well, he's been, he's been uh, irritable for a while. Um, uh, comorbidity. As mentioned, anxiety disorders, panic disorders, social anxiety disorders, specific phobias, PTSD, approximately 75% of bipolar one disorder um, individuals uh, have uh, anxiety disorder diagnosis as well. Um, that is very high, uh, certainly. Um, there, so this is a disorder that is comorbid with a lot of, uh, you know, potential, potentially, you know, comorbid with a, with a lot, and there's very one less standalone bipolar one disorders. Um, 
attention deficit. The, 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 the DSM-5 groups all three of these together, all, all these, these conduct disorders and um, ADHD, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, any disruptive move, impulse control or conduct disorder, and any substance use disorder, it's over 50% of the bipolar one individuals who also live with or suffer from those disorders. And um, you know, there, there is a tendency to use, as I discussed during the episodes, and it becomes that chicken and egg issue where did the substance use induce the mania or the bipolar or did the, um, you know, the substance use uh, add to the expression, the genetic prevalence that was there the whole time of the bipolar disorder tendency, and it just needed the um, substance or alcohol to, um, you know, express itself. Uh, you know, these are fascinating questions for um, future uh, research and study. Alcohol use disorder is also over 50%. Um, again, I, I would I would say that that uh, it's possible that the people uh, have uh, increased alcohol use in a manic state to calm down. Um, and and if you are uh, comorbid with both bipolar one and alcohol use disorder, there's increased risk for suicide. Uh, this is um, another Rothko, just. A, a beautiful painting is is it's people trying to duplicate Rothko all the time and you just can't so um, and of course Rothko as mentioned uh, previously uh, killed himself so here is a, this is kind of a fun one the cartoon that I mentioned earlier that I'm not sure if I'm feeling creatively inspired or if I'm about to have a manic episode um, you know humor is a part of coping and you know I, I actually I think that cartoon is funny but it's not to be ignored that if you look at these people that are on and this is a very selective list this is my list and apologies if I've left your favorite uh, bipolar uh, one uh, individual off the list but the, there's there's several um, you know politicians and scientists and authors that I did not put on but um, you know primarily it is all uh, bipolar one individuals Maria Bamford my personal hero the comedian is bipolar two diagnosed and she is on the list because I couldn't I couldn't not have her on there but you know so so the, there, there is this notion that the functionality is impaired when people suffer from this disorder and that especially if you have psychotic symptoms and especially if you have mood incongruent psychotic symptoms you uh, test lower on cognitive test well you know tell that to Frank Sinatra tell that to Ted Turner and additionally it's it's not it's not uh, you, you run down this list and you see names like Van Gogh, names like Towns Van Zandt, um, Ernest Hemingway, and there are, there are some Dolores O'Riordan, who is the lead singer of the Cranberries, Edgar Allan Poe, Jackson Pollock. You see some rough, Mark Rothko. You see some rough ends here, so it's certainly not to be um, uh, made light of. Amy Winehouse is at the bottom there. Also, someone who I adore, adored, adore. Um, Finally, the most important slide on here is um, for those of you out there like me who are diagnosed with bipolar one and you are in a state where you need help, Hollywood Mental Health Services um, is available uh, business hours. Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance is available 24 hours a day. And if you are in crisis, you can text DBSA7, text DBSA to 741741. Um, you know, again, mentioned catastrophic uh, consequences are not only possible, they're extremely likely. They're, they're mentioned again and again, story after story with uh, this disorder. And uh, dis despite uh, the notion and the feeling of not wanting to get help in the middle of mania, um, recognize that uh, things could, you, you, you could look back and wish that you had. Um, so I hope this has been informative and thank you for listening.